烧，银铃声，卡埃拉铃，阿萨卡哈拉铃，扎卡拉铃，烧埃铃铃声。Namaste. Welcome to Shrimad Devi Bhagavatam. The Sanskrit verse you just heard is the Sodashi Mantra. Sodashi Mantra is the most powerful and beneficial Vedic prayer. It invokes the Shakti of Goddess Lalita, also known as Tripura Sundari, Mahamaya. Durga and many other names. Who is Goddess Lalita? This Shrimad Devi Bhagavatam is her story. Listen, and you will gain immense spiritual benefit. Namaste. So, this is the second part of the fifth chapter of the first skanda. Of Shrimad Devi Bhagavatam, and in the last episode, Vishnu lost his head. <laughs> See, this is another、uh, incident that proves that Vishnu is not actually supreme. If he was supreme, or if any of the gods were supreme, then these things wouldn't happen to them. They would be invulnerable, changeless. That's the meaning of supreme. Supreme God means nothing or no one can challenge their supremacy. So, if we go through the whole Vedic literature and examine all these different personalities, the only one who meets that criterion is Sadashiva. And Bhagavati, Mahashakti, Mahamaya—they never change. They are invulnerable, but their expansions in the forms of the demigods come under the modes of material nature, and therefore they have to undergo so many troubles. So, when Vishnu's head was cut off by the bowstring. The demigods were freaking out because they knew that they're not independent; they're not invulnerable. You know, stuff can happen to them, and it does all the time. It even happens to Vishnu. So, let's pick up where we left off. At this juncture, seeing Shiva and the other devas crying. Brahaspati, supremely versed in the Vedas, consoled them thus: "O、oh, highly fortunate one, what use there will be in thus crying and repenting? You ought now to consider the means that you should adopt to redress your calamities. O、oh, Lord of the Devas, fate and one's own exertion and intelligence are equal. If the success comes not through fate, luck, or chance," One is certainly to show one's prowess and merit. Indra said, "Fie to your exertion! When before our eyes the head of Bhagavan Vishnu himself has been carried off, fie, fie to your prowess and intelligence! Fate is, in my opinion, supreme." So Indra, <laughs> kind of a wise guy. <laughs> Correcting Brihaspati, the guru of the demigods, but he has a point. After all, it was their so-called intelligence and prowess that got them into this fix, isn't it? Brahma's bright idea to have the little insect eat through the bowstring. That way, he could blame the insect if Vishnu got angry when he was woke up. See, this is the material world. Everybody has an agenda. Everybody has a desire, 
and it conflicts with other people's desires. And so they try to come up with all these strategies so that, you know, if anything goes wrong or if somebody doesn't like what they're trying to do, they can still somehow or other get what they want, isn't it? But the funny thing about those strategies is that they almost always fail. <laughs> so here we are in the material world. We're trying to get what we want. Everybody else is trying to get what they want. Our interests are conflicting. Uh, there's always conflict. There's always strife and argument. And nobody is right when everybody is wrong. Uh, because everybody is going for their own service instead of the service of God. This is the fundamental problem. This egotism, ahankara, false egotism. But the fundamental principle of this creation is ahankara. We saw when we were studying the Buddhist teaching, the Paticca Samuppada, that the very first beginning of all this is the delusion that I am an individual. I am a separate being, completely different from everything else. This is the root delusion of material existence. So even the demigods are suffering from this same delusion, and as a result, they get themselves into trouble. <laughs> now let's see how they try to get out. Brahma said, whatever auspicious or inauspicious is ordained by daiva, fate. Everyone must bear that. No one can go beyond the daiva. When one has taken up a body, one must experience pleasure and pain. There is no manner of doubt in this. See, in long past days, by the irony of fate, Shambhu severed my head. His generative organ, too, dropped down through a curse. Similarly, Hari's head has today fallen into the salt ocean. By the influence of time, Indra, the lord of Shachi, had a thousand genital marks all over his body, was expelled from heaven, and had to live in the Manasarovara, in the lotuses, and had to suffer many other miseries. O oh, glorious ones, when such personages have suffered pains, then who else is there in the world that does not suffer? So you all cease sorrows and meditate on the eternal Mahamaya, who is the mother of all, who is the support of all, who is of the nature of Brahma Vidya, the supreme knowledge, and who is beyond the gunas, who is the prime prakriti, and who pervades the three lokas, the whole universe, moving and unmoving. She will dispense our welfare. So here Brahma gives the conclusion of all this philosophizing, <laughs> when all is said and done, is whatever the universal mother's will, that becomes our fate. And nobody can counter it, even the demigods. A couple of episodes ago, Vishnu was complaining, like, who wants to take birth in these wombs of, of human beings and lower animals? You know, <laughs> if I was independent, if I was really the God, then this kind of nonsense wouldn't happen to me. Uh, why do I have to fight the demons for 10,000 years? You know, this is agony. This is, this is horrible, right? And then he, he gets a chance to take a little rest. And the next thing, the demigods come to him and they want to do a sacrifice. So they try to wake him up. And as a result, he loses his head. <laughs> so really... Brahma is right. There's only one solution, and that is to approach the, the real transcendental goddess. Sadashiva, Brahman, is beyond all this. He's not concerned about all this in the least. That's her business. She is the consciousness. She is the manifestation. She is Daiva. She is fate. So if we want release from our troubles, we have to approach her. 
Sutta said, Thus saying to the devas, Brahma ordered all the Vedas that were incarnate there in their forms for the successful issue of the devas' work. Brahma said, O Vedas, now go on and chant hymns to the sacred highest Devi Mahamaya, who is Brahma Vidya, who brings all issues to their successful conclusion, and who is hidden in all forms. Hearing his words, the all beautiful Vedas began to chant hymns to Mahamaya, who can be comprehended by jnana and who pervades the world. The Vedas said, Obeisance to the Devi, to Mahamaya, to the Auspicious One, to the Creatrix of the Universe, we bow down to Thee, who is beyond the Gunas, the ruler of all the beings. O Mother, Thou givest to Shankara even his desires. Thou art the receptacle of all the things. Thou art the prana of all the living beings. Thou art buddhi, intelligence, lakshmi, wealth, shobha, beauty, kshama, forgiveness, shanti, peace, shraddha, faith, medha, intellect, dhriti, fortitude, and smriti, memory. Thou art the bindu, mm, over the pranava, aum, and thou art of the nature of the crescent moon. Thou art Gayatri, thou art Vyahriti, thou art Jaya, Vijaya, Dhatri, the supportress, Lajja, modesty, Kirti, fame, Itcha, will, and Daya, mercy in all beings. O Mother, thou art the merciful mother of the three worlds. Thou art the adorable auspicious Vidya, knowledge benefiting all the Lokas. Thou destroyest the universe, and thou skillfully residest hidden in the Bija mantras. Therefore, we are praising thee. This is deep. Well, the Vedas are deep. The Vedas know all the secrets. See, the Vedas are the fountain of knowledge. This is why the demigods and the demons are differentiated because the, the devas follow the authority of the Vedas. The devas act to support and propagate the Vedas. The demons are against the Vedas. They're only interested in their own welfare, and they want to make up some different philosophy based on their own speculation, according to their ideas and preferences. So that's why they always lose, you know? usually catastrophically. And we're about to see this here on this planet, which has been taken over by the demons, and uh, they're about to get kicked out <laughs> by the results of their own actions. As always, huh? they're creating such terrible karma, the whole planet is just gonna smash them. So anyway, this contains some very deep secrets that the pranava, Aum. Uh, don't mispronounce it Om. <laughs> because first of all, it has three letters. A, U, M. A, U, M. And each one gets a full beat. So, it's not Om. It's A, U, M. And then there's the Bindu. The dot over the M. What does that mean? Well, in the pronunciation, it means a nasal termination. And without that nasal termination, the effect of chanting any mantra, especially a bija mantra like Aum, is temporary. It does not carry forward into the next life. It does not give uh, an exalted destination in the next birth. It only can give limited benefits in the present body. So, when chanting uh, Vedic mantras, Ashura, every Vedic mantra begins with Aum and should end with Aum. So by chanting Aum correctly, then one gets the maximum benefit. 
And then she, she also, the Vedas also uh, mention that she is skillfully hidden in the Bija mantras. What are the Bija mantras? Well, you heard them at the beginning of the video. Aung, Shring, Hring, Kling, Ein, Sao. Huh? These are the Bijas, the seed mantras. And each of them refers to a specific potency of the mother, of the goddess, Mahamaya, and brings out this energy. And it's hidden. See, it's different from the ordinary Vedic mantras. Like an ordinary Vedic mantra would be Aum Shri Mahamaya Namaha, something like that. But hidden within this Aum huh, and these other bijas, Shring, Hring, Kling, Ein, Sao, there are the potencies of the goddess. The potency of Aum is Gayatri. And in a recent video, we went over the 51 manifestations of the Gayatri and the potencies of this tremendously powerful sound vibration. But you have to chant it properly. And that's why it'll be described later on in the Bhagavata that one should always terminate the Bijams with the Bindu, the crescent moon and the dot. So you can see this in the Aum symbol. It's right there, the letter A, the letter U, and the bindu, the crescent and the dot. That's why we wear the, the bindu on our forehead, on the third eye, the Agnya Chakra, huh? to remind us of this. So you have to know the significance of it, and this is one of the great secrets of the Vedic knowledge. Brahma, Vishnu, Maheshwar, Indra, Surya, Agni, Saraswati, and other regions of the universe are all thy creation. So none of them is superior to thee. Thou art the mother of all things, moving and non-moving. O mother, when thou dost will to create this visible universe, thou createst first Brahma, Vishnu, and Maheshwara, and makest them create, preserve, and destroy this universe. But thou remainest quite unattached to the world. Ever thou remainest constant in thy one form. No one in this universe is able to know thy nature, nor is there anybody who can enumerate thy names. How can he promise to jump across the illimitable ocean who cannot jump across an ordinary well? O Bhagavati, no one amongst the Devas even knows particularly thy endless power and glory. Thou art alone the lady of the universe and the mother of the world. We Vedas all bear testimony how thou alone hast created all this unreal and fleeting universe. O Devi, thou, without any effort and having no desires, has become the cause of this visible world, thyself remaining unchanged. This is a great wonder. We cannot conceive this combination of contrary varieties in one. O oh, Mother, how can we understand thy power, unknown to all the Vedas even, when even thou thyself dost not know thy nature? We are bewildered at this. O oh, Mother, is it that thou dost not know about the falling off of Vishnu's head? Or knowingly thou wanted to examine Vishnu's prowess? Is it that Hari incurred any heinous sin? How can that be? Where is sin to thy followers who serve thee? O mother, why art thou so much indifferent to the Vedas? O mother, why art thou so much indifferent to the devas? It is a great wonder that the head of Vishnu is severed. Really, we are merged in great misfortunes. Thou art clever in removing the sorrows of thy devotees. Why art thou delaying in fixing again the head on Vishnu's body? So, 
at this turn of events, even the Vedas are dumbfounded. Even the Vedas can't understand why she does the way she does. This, this whole universe and all these stories in the scriptures are all just her pastimes. She is the Mahamaya, the great illusion. And we've gone into this philosophy very deeply in our earlier series, especially like Uladu Narpadu and the other works by Ramana Maharshi. How that this manifestation is not actually real. It's like a movie, like a drama or a play, or like a dream. When you're in a dream, it seems completely real, doesn't it? But then as soon as you wake up and you're in a different state of consciousness, you go, oh, that was just a dream. No, no big problem. In the same way, when we're in this material world, it seems very real. <laughs> Indeed. But once we shift our consciousness into the Turiya state, we can see that even what we call waking consciousness is actually just a dream. And because all these objects that we see are temporary, they can't have real existence. Although they appear to be factual, they are actually unreal. Uh, this is the verdict of the Vedic scriptures. So if we want the highest benefit, if we want liberation, if we want enlightenment, if we want to see things as they really are and be rid of the mental anxieties that are caused by doubt and uncertainty, we have to approach the highest Devi, uh, the greatest goddess, who is superior even to the demigods like Brahma, Vishnu, Shiva, and beg from her her deep teachings. Aum Tatsat. Aum Shakti Aum. 